Hi, welcome back to the channel. I'm Zubin and in this video, I'm going to talk to you about the five really important things that you do not want to do when you're transitioning careers from wherever you are right now to a career in code. And in the next video or in another video, I'm going to tell you the five things that you must do. But for this one, we're going to talk about the five that you really, really want to avoid doing. So stick around and let's get into that in a moment. Welcome to my channel. Listen, after more than 12 years as a lawyer, I tried to start my own company. It was a startup and I was a non-technical founder. Sure, we managed to get a product to market, but you know what? I had a horrible time finding technical co-founders. In fact, I found a couple, but they ended up leaving. I was so sick of it. At the age of 37, I finally taught myself to code. But man, it wasn't easy. A year or so later, I ended up joining a startup as an engineer. And a year after that, I joined Google as an engineer. So listen, if you want to transition your career into tech, or you want to become your own technical co-founder, subscribe to my channel. Now, before we move any further, it's really, really important for your health, well-being, and longevity that you like and subscribe to this channel, because I'm going to be sharing a whole ton of information over the coming months that'll help you if you're looking to change careers and become a coder, or you just want to start your own startup and you want to be your own technical co-founder. Either way, like and subscribe. So before I get into the five things you don't want to do, let me set some context for you. I was born in India and I did my schooling there and I did law school there. I started my legal career there and that was back in 2003, so some time ago now. I started off as a lawyer that went to court and then I moved into corporate law. I'd never really at that point of time thought too much about programming because I was so focused on my career in law and being, you know, a lawyer. But along the way, I realized I really did like technology and I was quite curious about technology. I also really wanted to have a startup. Unfortunately, the global financial crisis hit just a little after I moved to Australia. And that was a very, very difficult period for those of you who were working then, you'd remember that. But I survived that. And this itch to teach myself to program or at least start a tech company started to get bigger and bigger. It started to get itchier. Programming to me was a magical act. It still is a magical act. It is something that I find extraordinarily creative, um, incredibly addictive and terribly frustrating, all three on the same day. I really wanted to program, but I was quite stuck with all these myths that I had in my head and I did not really understand that all of them were myths. For example, I thought you had to be some sort of genius or really mathematical or, you know, that, that you had to be some kind of savant to be able to code like it was a very special skill that only uber nerds could do. And that's really not true. And so I labored for many, many years under the misapprehension that I could not code or I wasn't smart enough to be a coder. Meanwhile, I was still successfully practicing law and getting more and more senior there. So it was getting harder and harder for me to, to take the plunge, if you like, to move into something else. Now, there is another video on my channel that goes into that entire journey from how I went from lawyer to coder um, and now eventually ended up at Google. You should definitely check out the other video if you want to know the full story of how I went from a lawyer to a coder via a number of other routes. I was about 37 years old when I finally managed to learn to code. And I say finally because I tried to learn to code once before 2014, then in 2015, then in 2016. So I was finally successful in 2018 and I got my first job as an engineer in 2019. By that time, I was, I think, 38 years old. So by no means a young, you know, sort of early stage career changer. It was quite a late stage career change. And so that's why it's really important that I share with you these five things that you do not want to do when you're trying to change career or when you're trying to learn to code, even if it's not a career change. Or you know what, even if you just want to be your own technical co-founder at a startup, these are five things you need to know about learning to code. In another video, I am going to talk about the five things that you do want to do. But in this one, only the five that you don't want to do. So number one, the number one thing to not do when you're teaching yourself to code is don't stare at the mountaintop. Now I know we're all in a hurry and we all want to get there faster than is probably possible, but that's part of the problem. The longer we stare at the mountaintop, the more likely we are going to get discouraged, confused, frustrated, and feel poorly about ourselves. It's really, really, really important to understand that no matter how much you stare at that mountaintop, it's not going to get any closer just by looking at it. Instead, it's better to move your gaze downwards 
and focus on the process of learning because the process of learning is something that's going to have to stay with you for the rest of your career as a coder. You're always having to learn new tools, new frameworks, new paradigms, new words, new technical concepts, new ways of working with your colleagues. It's a constant, never-ending process of learning. And so if you stare at the mountaintop or you think that there's a final destination, you are not going to be happy and you're not going to be fulfilled. Also, if you keep rushing yourself to feel competent, you're not going to feel comfortable in what you do. Competence takes time. Mastery takes even more time. So don't rush and don't keep staring at that mountaintop. Don't number two is don't mistake your doubts for evidence. Look, I get it. We all have doubt. I have doubt. We all constantly battle with doubt. And from the doubt comes fear. This is part of the human condition. It's part of growing. It's part of operating outside your comfort zone. But if you assume that your doubts are real or that they indicate your reality or prescribe your reality, then you're never going to overcome them. The fact is that we're all going to feel deeply doubtful of ourselves and deeply fearful about whether or not we're going to succeed at some point in time. Don't let those doubts become your reality or don't confuse it for being real because that's going to stop you dead in your tracks. Unfortunately, doubts do have a way of convincing us that they're very, very real. But I can promise you this, no matter what your doubts and fears are today, they have no bearing. They have no indication on what your tomorrow could be like, as long as you don't pay too much attention to your doubts and fears. Now, we all have the imposter syndrome and anybody who tells you otherwise is lying or has never been outside their comfort zone. Since we all have it anywhere, don't assume that that's got to dictate your reality. It's really up to you what you do next and how you shape your tomorrow. So don't let your doubts fool you into thinking your tomorrow isn't as bright as it could be. Your doubts say nothing about your tomorrow. Don't number three. Don't compare your reality to your secret wishes. Now this is something that a lot of people I coach have confirmed is a major factor that plays on in their life, right? What happens is we end up comparing the reality of the world around us or the outcomes that we manage to produce in a finite amount of time with our secret wishes. Now you know what I'm talking about here. Anytime that you secretly wish that you'd get really successful quickly or easily or both, that's a secret wish and often life doesn't play ball like that. I've tried to learn the guitar faster than it was possible. Heck, even when I was learning to code, I often thought that I could do something much faster than was actually realistic. And so that secret wish that we have inside, that secret fantasy, if we compare that to a reality, we're always going to feel disappointed. We're always going to feel discouraged. There is a process to follow. Things are going to take more time than you bargain for and definitely more time than you secretly wish for. So if you're not aware of the fact that this secret wish of yours is playing on your mind, you are going to get frustrated and disappointed. If you get frustrated and disappointment, you're not actually going to find the energy to keep moving forward when all those discouragements and disappointments start to pile up. And believe me, they will. When you're learning a new skill, they always do. The frustrations always do. It's important to remember that any goal that you're pursuing that is beyond your current level of skill or ability is going to take time. It's going to take a lot of energy and effort, and it's going to take persistence. There is every likelihood that you will spend a few months moving forward without much positive reinforcement from the world around you, without really seeing many results. But there comes a point in time when a flip happens, when well past the point that other people have given up, if you've kept going, you will suddenly jump up a level or two and you'll suddenly see yourself having made progress. So one way of making sure that you keep your focus on getting better rather than getting immediate or quick results is to have a simple motto. My motto, for example, is 1% better every day. I just focus on maybe 30 minutes or one hour of the activity that I want to get better at every single day. Just do it like, like a discipline, right? And then you will find that you slowly start getting better. And knowledge over time doesn't just stack up. It actually compounds, it's exponential. You just got to give it the time. If you invest $1 now, it's not going to give you much in about three months. But in about 20 years, it will. Now, I'm not saying it's going to take you 20 years to learn to code, but the point is compounding is very real and it's very real even with knowledge and skills acquisition. So it's really important that you don't measure your reality against your secret wishes, but instead you stay focused on getting better every single day. 
My don't number four is don't take big decisions on bad days. Look, you're going to have a ton of bad days. There's just no getting around it. No matter what you do, if you're trying to do something new, if you're trying to improve, if you're trying to learn a new skill, if you're trying to change your life, whatever it is, you're going to have bad, discouraging, dark days. It's just the way it is. Now, you do not want to quit on those days. It's absolutely fine to feel like quitting. But if you do quit, that's the point at which you fail. As long as you haven't quit, you haven't yet failed. You just haven't got the result you're looking for yet. So it's very, very important that if you're tired, overwhelmed, frustrated, discouraged, disappointed, whatever it is, all these things are going to be a part of your journey, right? So if you're feeling that, take a break, take a day off, take a week off. There were times when I stopped programming for a week or two simply because I was so overwhelmed with frustration and disappointment and that fear that I'm investing all this time and effort and I can see the months having flown behind me and I don't really have the results I wanted, right? H had I quit then, I would never have gone on to become an, a professional engineer, eventually landing up at, at Google. I mean, the only reason I ended up where I ended up and I'm able to keep going today is because I didn't quit. Instead, I took breaks. So it's really important to let yourself take a break every now and then long enough to get your energy back, but not so long that you lost your momentum, right? You want to be able to balance enough time off to be rejuvenated against having lost your momentum. Do not lose your momentum. Is it a bad day today? Yes. Okay. No decisions are going to be taken today. Maybe I put my pen down, step away, do something else. Remember that when you're outside your comfort zone, there's going to be a lot of resistance. There's going to be a lot of pain, a lot of fear, a lot of frustration, and a lot of doubt. That's why athletes have coaches. I'm a big fan of learning from athletes because what they do in athletics and in sport is actually no different from what you need to do in the rest of your life. Okay, you have a coach, you have someone out there who gives you a little bit of advice, or maybe they just give you a different perspective. Whatever it is, it's just a mental game. There is a lot that you need to control in your mind in order to keep moving forward. And one of those things is knowing when you're not in a good emotional state. And therefore, it's not the right time to take big, momentous decisions like stopping something. So on a bad day, take a break, but don't take any decisions. And finally, don't number five. Don't assume that your current results reflect your ability. Just think about that very carefully for a moment. Your current results are just the results of past effort. So imagine if the initial results we had from, you know, a child trying to learn to walk or the first few times you picked up an instrument and it didn't work out. Imagine if you took those results and assumed that they were indicative of your ability. Imagine um, if Michael Jordan felt that getting cut from the basketball team in school meant that he could never play basketball or he wasn't good enough. Maybe in that moment he did think he wasn't good enough. But there was a part of him that realized he could get better. And that really is at the heart of it. It's kind of the growth mindset concept that a lot of people have talked about, right? If you can get better, then today's results reflect only today's ability. Today's results do not reflect your overall ability. Your true ability is a product of persistence. It comes at the end of a long journey, not at the start. At the start comes the frustration, the obstacles, the difficulties, everything that impedes your momentum happens at the beginning. Most importantly, at this stage, it is important that you do not let your internal dialogue go from, gosh, I don't know how to do this, to I cannot do this. The fact that you don't know how to do it does not mean you cannot do it. All that you have is a knowledge gap or a skills gap, which can be overcome. Knowledge can be acquired, skills can be grown. You can 100% overcome that. You just have to focus your attention on the things that you can do to overcome that, which actually reminds me of a really good John Wooden coach who used to be a basketball coach. What he said was, never let what you cannot do stand in the way of what you can do. And I swear to you, hold on to that one tenet, right? Because every day you're gonna see all the things you cannot do. You're gonna go to work, you're gonna do something new, and somebody else around you is gonna be able to do it better. And you're gonna think, heck, I don't know how to do it that well. That's true, that's okay. Tomorrow, maybe you will. If you practice, if you stay the course, you 100% will get as good as that person did. In fact, if you think to the start of your career, there were things that you can now do that you thought were pretty impressive, you know, five years ago, six years ago, maybe. 
whatever it is, whether it's sport, whether it was how you were in high school compared to how you are now at university, or you know, maybe you're in your middle of your career and you're thinking back to you know, at the start of your career, there are skills you've acquired over a period of time. So it's really important that if you feel you're not able to do something, you remember that that's just right now. You can't do something yet. The important thing is to keep the momentum. Keep your focus on the next best step that you can take that will either close the gap or eliminate the gap altogether between where you are now and where you'd like to be. It's just a question of time. So that's it, my friends. The top five things you do not want to do when you're transitioning career, especially if you're transitioning career to code or you're teaching yourself to code to become your own technical co-founder. Now, if you've made it this far, chances are you got something out of this video. I hope that I'll be able to give you a lot more in future videos and other videos as well. So please like, please subscribe to this channel and let me know in the comments below. This is really important. Let me know in the comments below if any of these resonate with you, because it's really important that we realize we're not alone in this. Every one of us is going through similar issues, right? And so share your power, share your knowledge with people, just like I'm trying to do right now. You can do this and I'm here with you every step of the way. I'll see you soon.